Brothers and sisters, we welcome you to a new episode of Muslims in the Land of Opportunity. We welcome our guests and we welcome our sisters here and um, all of you, all of our Iqra TV uh, audience from across the world. Alhamdulillah, we've been having uh, a lot of fun in here. Um, during the first episode, we discussed some of the uh, topics that will be, inshallah, elaborating some of the uh, issues of concern. We uh, talked about Hollywood, we talked about youth, masajid, we talked about the, you know, the Muslim society in North America and there was Mashallah, you know, amazing topics, but again, it was just introductory. As we, we mentioned that it will be, inshallah, discussed in more details in the following episodes. Inshallah ta'ala, during this episode, we'll be talking about the Islamic revival movement. Something that is, mashallah, mind-blowing to know that Islam has been in the States for such a long time. Not just, early, you know, like the past 10, 20, 30, or even 50 years, but it started really a long time ago. Here we'll find the American historians People, people like, uh, for example, Michael Kozinski and Jay Milton, they mentioned to us in their book, Islam in North America. And we find also people like Ronald Judy uh, that, that has a very, very um, helpful source called Disforming the American Canon. It's like narratives of Arabic and African slaves talking about their experience in slavery. As SubhanAllah, Islam started very, very early on when the Spaniard uh, Muslims or the Andalusians basically, you know, Muslims as, as you all know that Muslims used to live in Spain and Islam was present in Spain for 800 years and uh, Spain they spoke Arabic and you'll find that Muslims at that time they were very well known uh, to actually travel and um, you know really master the map of the earth they knew very well, very well their paths uh, through the oceans and the seas and even the, when they talk about Columbus discovering the states they mentioned that Columbus did not come by himself, but he actually had um, Arab Muslims, or what they call the Moors, they coming with him, the, those like Spanish Muslims, to, to guide him. And even the leader of the ship himself, as historians mentioned, he was uh, a Muslim. And um, so the, the, the first, the first, the very first Muslims who came to the U.S. came with the Spanish invaders, who came, um, you know, who were the first Europeans to ever make it here um, to the States, and we find that. After that, when they realized, after you know, of course, the uh, you know um, the uh, European invaders, or uh, you know, they started basically building settlements, and they uh, called themselves later on part of the history to be the settlers, meaning those who came to basically um, build the U.S. and uh, establish this great civilization that now we see basically dominating the world and being you know the the country that everyone looks up to and desire, it started really early on. So anyway, during that part of the history, they realized the importance of, um, you know, economy and they realized the importance of labor. You know, and, and for every, for every uh, civilization to succeed, it needs planning and it needs execution. Planning needs brains and execution needs muscles, right? So at the time, you can imagine, we, we spoke last time about the, how humongous the states is, like 55 countries combined in one country. It's like a continent, right? So they started important, uh, they started import, importing the slaves from Africa and started first when the, um, you know, working on the plantation uh, fields in, in South, uh, in the South, basically, um, in the southern part of the U.S. So they started uh, bringing a lot of the slaves and a lot of these slaves, they came from Africa, of course, um, mostly came from West Africa and others even came from East Africa as well. But we'll find that the historians say, some of them mention, and I've read these things you know, myself, um, you know, it was about half, some historians say third, others say even two thirds of the slaves were Muslim. And those Muslims, despite the fact that there was a lot of efforts that been done to wipe out their Islamic identity and, and totally subjugate them and control them and enslave them to that white master, uh, they still, they, they really practiced and their religion and they did stick to their faith and uh, you'll find that there was a lot of writings to these slaves. They were, subhanAllah, uh, such devout Muslims who opposed, um, you know, and they tried their best. Of course, you could do that for a second, for a first, second, third generation, but, you know, there was a lot of also efforts being done to kind of separate the, 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 the second generation from the first so that the kids would be raised a certain way and not follow the way of the parents. 
So we'll find that Islam really started very early on in the yeah. States, yeah. So this means that ex uh, Islam entered the States uh, by two ways, by the Spanish uh, Muslims and by the African slaves. So these are the two ways that how they started right, the right, right. However, there. However, you know, those, um, when we speak about Islamic presence, uh, we have yeah. to mention, of course, we're here from, we're speaking from a historical background. Yes, yeah. it is true that they came, but were they able to spread Islam? Were they able to practice Islam? Of course they weren't, because uh, the, uh, all these efforts were obviously, you're a slave, you don't control your, yourself, you don't control no, your I life, mean this, you don't the control start, your actions. The start, this is how it entered the states, I mean. Yes. It's by the, the Spanish people, when the, the Muslims there, plus the African slaves. This is yes. how Muslims entered the states, yes. not how Muslims, I mean, how they were there, they started to be there. Exactly. Yes, but yes. They, did, uh, they didn't practice their... Uh, I mean, some Muslim of them did there. practice, but uh, as you can see that... Um, it was, it was a, a, a lot of these efforts were really uh, being resisted uh, by, by, you know, uh, by the masters because they know that Islam can liberate people. Yeah. You cannot be a slave and a Muslim. It will be uh, yeah. it, it just uh, too challenging for them. So uh, there was a lot of efforts being done, you know, um, to, to wipe out this Islamic identity. And uh, unfortunately, uh, it, it was successful. Um, so uh, we find that the, the African Muslims, they, they lost basically their identity uh, and then all of their, um, speaking of the you know, following generations, they basically um, start practicing Christianity and they start starting uh, totally forgetting their past. However, we find that also some of the historians, they tell you about even the, according to them, and subhanAllah, it's, uh, again, when it comes to history, you always find different sources. And this is a very interesting source that I came across that talks about Native Americans or the Indian Americans, you know what they call like uh, Indian. Red Indians? Indian. Uh, they call like the Native Americans or yeah. you know the Indian Americans. The, even some of them were Muslims, like some of these tribes, they were Muslim tribes. They even find uh, writings by the Native Americans which were in Arabic. Uh, even some of them, uh, you know, knew the Fatiha. Some of them actually wrote down a Hadith. And some of these tribes, they had like they had a tribe called Medina, a tribe called Mecca. They had like so it was really interesting. Like I and um, in my mixed mixed town, next to my town in the states where I live, it's called Medina, just the next town. And this area is known to be a, one of the oldest places in America where the Native Americans used to live. And I was I'm, I'm like living maybe 10 minutes away from it. So we, we find that Islam has been really in the States a long time ago. So the historians, they say that most likely at one point, at, you know, at one point in history, some Muslims, um, dua, you know, or Muslim preachers, they basically went to the States to convey the message of Islam early on in the history, even way before Columbus, because a lot of the mainstream historians, they say, well, you know, it, it's um, before Columbus, nobody knew about the States, nobody re-migrated. However, re that research proves otherwise. So uh, uh, at this stage, uh, the Islam was just you know basically present, but then it totally disappeared. And then, alhamdulillah, now we're going to talk about the Islamic revival. Now, when we talk about Islamic revival, how it was revived and came back to life after it was gone, how it, how it did come back to life. So it it did start um, as you know um, historians also mention, and and these are I, I just gave you some of these sources that um, uh, Muslims started migrating to the states course long time ago but then really and the, the, they had the US received uh, big waves of migration you know from different parts of the Muslim world especially from the Middle East from countries like uh, Lebanon uh, Palestine from like what's known now to be Pakistan and, and and other countries as well and those like the first almost the, the first generation of, of Muslims who came from these countries they were not uh, really, um, you know, uh, educated. They were not professional. They were not very skilled. Uh, uh, you know, um, basically, when it comes to uh, some of the um, professional work and um, uh, fields of, of, of sciences that, mashallah, now Muslims master in the U.S. So the first generation, according to the historians uh, or you know, uh, of, of um, you know, sociology and those who really researched the American waves of migration, they said that a lot of them lived in places like Detroit. They came to work in the car industry, you know, uh, and others went to Sacramento to be like to, to build homes and so on. And we find that um, Subhanallah, that started changing dramatically after um, you know second wave of Muslim immigrants start, starting come to the U.S. from places like, as, as I mentioned, the sub Indian subcontinent, but the Middle East 
and uh, they most likely came from this, uh, these places. But then, one thing that here changed, that those uh, Muslims that started migrating to the States, SubhanAllah, they were very educated. And that was like in the early 50s, very professional, uh, a lot of engineers, a lot of doctors, you know, and, and mashallah, it was uh, something that uh, helped Muslims really prosper because it was, uh, the base was, was alhamdulillah, um, you know, this time was totally different uh, because the, uh, those early Muslims who came in the beginning of the century, se century a lot of them, and uh, as I mentioned uh, in the last episode, that I've, I've, been to, I've been to a lot of these places and I found that um, uh, a lot of these cities have Islamic names. And when I research, you know, what's, uh, what's wrong? Like, or, uh, you know, how come this is Arabic name and, and, and there's no Arabs in here? They say, well, they're, they're, the, the family came maybe 100 years back from this country and they were Muslim and even the, like they have a cemetery here, Islamic gra graveyard, but then they, they all of them converted and became Christian, unfortunately, because again, uh, lack of, of education from the Muslim parents to their children. I mean, find like places like, you know, Cedar Rapids in Iowa, Places like Gary in Indiana, again um, Ann Arbor in Michigan, and uh, Detroit, we'll find, like and in Sacramento and, and elsewhere, where Muslims, mashallah, they were present. They had like pockets of Muslims, but then uh, these Muslims again they they got assimilated in society, and uh, they uh, their generations pr pretty much disappeared. Uh, okay, so I see the sister. She uh, I think she had a, um, a question for us. Uh, you were mentioning earlier, I think, before the program that you uh, wanted to ask. I just wanted to talk to ask about so that. basically, uh, um, okay. So, um, uh, inshallah. So, uh, go ahead. Uh, the do Muslim have uh, the wide range of activities now in uh, in America, and which states they they have these activities rather than other states? Okay, v v very nice. Alhamdulillah, you know. To give you the good news, mashallah, Muslims, um, you know, are, are present almost in, er in every major city that you visit. You find uh, Muslim masajid, like even these days, uh, like o almost like every week they're opening a new masjid, you know, and, and somewhere else uh, in different parts of the U.S. And um, uh, statistics say that there are about 6,000 masjid in Islamic Center in the U.S. There's a lot of activities that go on. And subhanAllah, we find that um, it's, it's, it's really amazing to find the, uh, the Muslim commu community over there is very diverse. You have the African-American Muslims who accepted Islam. You have the Arab Muslims. You have the Indian uh, Muslims or the Muslims who came from subcontinent, uh, from Pakistan, Bangladesh, and other countries. You find the Indonesian Muslims, uh, a lot of the Asian Muslims. Uh, you have we find the African Muslims who migrated actually from uh, Africa to the U.S. It's like, it's, it's amazing to see even um, you know, uh, Latin Muslims who accept Islam or Caucasian white Muslims who also accept Islam and all of them are praying in one place, you know, and, and under the same roof versus you find a lot of the other uh, religious institutions, um, a lot of the churches, the, it's like a, you go to, to one church, it's only Afri African Americans and only black, uh, you know, uh, community that, you know, that worship there. You find others uh, that have only Hispanic, only like, you know, Latin uh, Christians, uh, in, in these kind of churches, you find other churches that has only white. Even Subhanallah, you find even the the, the uh, you know each church is like is different. I mean, even each church we find um, so many kind of churches that that practice different kind of denominations or ideologies, basically for Christianity. There's so many, so many of them. Like maybe uh, can tell you hundreds of them. Subhanallah, um, and. Um, it, one thing that you know is that the majority of them, they only have one kind of people. But then you come to a masjid, even this is like the, the amazing experience that any non-Muslim, visit when, whenever they visit a masjid, they see the black person praying behind, the, I mean, praying behind or next to a white person. And the white person praying behind, you know, so, uh, the black imam, it's, it's common. And they even tell us, so subhanAllah, at one point, like, wow, like, you know, it must feel good, you know, to be in, like, I remember one of our friends was telling me, that uh, this non-Muslim visited the masjid. And the imam of the masjid wa was actually uh, African-American. Uh, African so the, the Muslim imam was, was black, basically. So this white person came to him who's, who's non-Muslim and he told him that uh, it must feel good to lead those people, you know? It must feel good to, to have white people praying behind you. So the, the, the imam was like, what? So for us, it's like we don't view people according to skin color. We view people according to their knowledge. How much Quran they memorize, how much, you know, they know. It's like for us, it's like even to think, subhanAllah, so you never. I mean, you find all these like masajid, you know, a lot of black imams, a lot of white imams, a lot of Arab imams, in Dupac, it's, it's variety, something that people don't find. So go back to our topic, the, 
or within the um, as as I'm going to the you know the the chain uh, and how it it, call, it all came together, you find that um, one of the really major movements that uh, uh, led uh, you know to the spread of Islam in the states. Ho however, it did start uh, based on a falsehood ideology. But then Allah Subhanahu wa Taala planned. Uh, Allah planned a uh, plan and subhanallah, you know, yes, although it started uh, based on fa falsehood, but then Allah guided them and it, and that, and, and then uh, it helped, it really contributed a lot um, towards the, the Islamic uh, presence in the U.S. and that Islamic revival movement, which was a movement called the Nation of Islam. I'm sure you've heard of the Nation of Islam. It's uh, uh, unfortunately, the, uh, it, it started as a racist movement because uh, the African Americans, the non-Muslim African Americans, they were under a lot of pressure. You know, um, at, uh, you know, they were at one point slaves until the time of Lincoln, who actually freed the slaves. Mm. And uh, uh, Link Lincoln basically, he uh, after he freed the slaves, they still suffered from something called segregation. But yes, yes, you you're not a slave anymore. Yes, you're free. But then, you cannot live with me. You have to have your own neighborhoods. You have to, you, you cannot be with me on the same bus. You cannot go with me to the same school, even bathrooms, even in this, like, there's like these bathrooms for African Americans and these... Even in education, they were... Uh, they, they were segregated, they were, it was separate. Education. It was absolutely separate. Yeah. Um, fa, fa basi so, so basically I was saying that, um, you know, e there was uh, segregation uh, and that segregation, it really uh, damaged the, the, the American uh, unity because now it... it uh, th there was a lot of, uh, of you know, uh, just uh, uh, feelings from both sides. The, uh, you know, the African Americans feeling oppressed, and then the, you have the white people feeling a certain way. And so it just started building uh, social uh, problems one after the other. But so, due to these like social, uh, you know, um, uh, basically, uh, you know, during uh, due to the social pressure here, it created also. Um, uh, it backfired in a way that you had some of these African Americans. They started movements. Some of them are Muslim, and by the way, others are not even uh, non-Muslim. So, so some of these movements, uh, they're about like black supremacy. So the fight How came, special? The fight came specifically for uh, racism because of racism, not because of uh, Muslims and Christians. It's because I'm black and white. No, no basically that movement the, it, it started. The treatment, the, the dis discrimination between. Uh, white and black, it yeah. has nothing to do has, with has Muslims do with and Muslims. Christians. Yeah. Right. Uh, a lot of these Muslims, a lot of these Muslims who embraced the, the ideology uh, of the nation of Islam, they, uh, they were um, basically the, the, the whole I idea of them being, you know, better than the white person, of them being Muslim and the white person is going to the hellfire, of the black, the uh, superiority of the black race, these were all ideologies, like the, the, Afri the, like the, uh, the nation of Islam did not accept any white it was only about the blacks. Yeah. So Elijah Muhammad, the founder of, the, of this um, uh, movement, he claimed to be a prophet. And he started calling African Americans who were really oppressed and felt really, you know, that they've been wronged by society. So that, that, that message appealed to a lot of them. So they started, you know, flocking and they started, you know, accepting Islam and it became famous. Yes, initially it was falsehood, but then inshallah ta'ala, we'll see how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala planned for it to, to, uh, to, to completely change and take a totally different route. As we see at one point that one of the biggest, uh, um, you know, supporters and, and one of the most influential leaders of the of the nation of Islam, he uh, of course his name is Malcolm X, one of the most famous uh, leaders and one of the most eloquent speakers in the history of the U.S. We found that uh, he embraced that ideology initially, but then Subhanallah, until he came to Hajj, until he came to Hajj, when he came to Hajj, he found that it was totally different. They're not just black people, given. But he said, I, I prayed and I, I ate with the whitest of the white and uh, with the blondest of the blonde. And, and he said that I, I sat with people who had, uh, you know, the, uh, the most amazing, uh, you know, uh, traits in a Muslim who were not even black. So that, that totally changed his, uh, his idea about Islam and he came back to the States and subhanAllah from that stage on, uh, Nation of Islam uh, followers took a different, um, different path and we'll see that this path eventually led to uh, the presence of the mainstream uh, Orthodox Islam. Inshallah, we'll mention after the break what happened. So stick around, inshallah, and do, don't go anywhere. We'll be back for more. We out there and we educate in society about who we are as Muslims. 
So if somebody comes and they come with that hate and they leave and they're like, I'm not Muslim, but I, I understand them. Alhamdulillah. Mercy for mankind clears up the misconceptions and pr provides one-on-one -on -one people that p you can talk to in person and explain and answer questions. Allah, 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 Allah. Okay, welcome back. And um, we're discussing the issue of revival movement in the States, how the Islamic revival movement started and how, alhamdulillah, it has brought us to where we are today. Uh, it's very pleasing. Alhamdulillah, I'll be sharing with you a lot of good news and I'll be sharing with you how it all, alhamdulillah, came together. And we were, we started, uh, you know, uh, the episode by mentioning that it's, it's, it's amazing how Allah plans things and how it, it just, Islam, uh, you know, came here with the slaves and even before the slaves uh, with the Native Americans or the Indian Americans and how uh, even uh, a movement uh, started which was based totally on falsehood which is the nation of Islam and was, which was racist and even by a false prophet but then the followers of this movement they realized starting with Malcolm X that uh, this was not the real Islam this was not the Islam that uh, should be embraced and uh, started by Malcolm X after his Hajj trip um, he, as he came to Mecca and um, he, he made Hajj with all variety of Muslims. He had Arabs, he had Asian, he had white, uh, he had Africans uh, praying next to him and, and doing Hajj with him. And he, he, when he went to the States, he understood that the leaders of the nation of Islam, they have deceived him and they have deceived all the followers. So he decided to really uh, speak, sp you know, speak out and he decided to really convey um, the, the orthodox version of Islam and which is you know basically uh, the truth according to the Quran and to the Sunnah so when he started doing this he started uh, basically breaking the unity of the nation of, of Islam so uh, what happened that they, they realized that this, this guy is dangerous so uh, at one point he was killed he was shot and killed and um, uh, Allah knows you know who did it but a lot of uh, historians they, they say that uh, it was uh, basically uh, the leaders of the nation of Islam who did that to kind of shut him down. But subhanAllah, from that point on, I can tell you, like I've met with so many African American Muslims and uh, they started all, all as nation of Islam followers. Especially like with the old generation, like I know I have a lot of good friends who are like maybe in their 50s and 60s, even 40s, late 40s, they, they tell me that they, they start off as nation of Islam, but then they embraced uh, the Sunni Islam and then they, they basically uh, took that as a way of life and uh, subhanAllah, so now talking about the indigenous Muslims who are born, uh, who are, are actually the people of the country who embrace Islam. But now talking about the uh, immigrant Muslims, uh, those who migrated from, the all, you know, from all these parts of the world and uh, they had a lot of success. They had a lot of success, as we said, a lot of them were very educated and very professional and uh, ma mashallah, they were able to, uh, to really accomplish the American dream. But subhanAllah, you know, uh, I will mention some of the needs and some of the challenges uh, that they had uh, doing that. Um, so I see that uh, uh, Muhammad uh, wanted yeah. to ask something. I want to ask the Nation of Islam. This was a racist movement, right? Right. Didn't it affect the image of Islam in the, in the US? Absolutely. Very smart question. Zakallah khair. Um, Allah reward you. Uh, it definitely has tarnished the image of Islam um, to the um, to the Caucasian uh, people because the the uh, the thought that every Muslim is racist, the thought that every Muslim you know think that the black race is better, and uh, a lot of the uh, you know a lot of the nation of Islam followers they were not really the best of examples, you know, and it, it definitely and it's one of the things that we as Muslims you know started like suffering from for many years is like. Muslim, that American people, they thought that uh, American Muslims are, uh, you know, just embracing the same version of the nation of Islam. But alhamdulillah, now pretty much it, it, it has, um, you know, disappeared. Alhamdulillah, for the most part. But, but it was definitely a challenge. Yep. I uh, see our sisters here, they wanted to ask uh, something. I mean, you were saying, like, you were telling me about, uh, you know, some of these, like, Islamic activities and, and how challenging it was. I remember, um, subhanAllah, the... Uh yeah, the activities there, yes, uh, uh, the Muslims there, uh, okay, what kind of activities do they do together there on daily or it's only on Juma day or whatever? I don't, I don't, uh, Friday, or uh, what are the activities of Muslims there in general? 
basically uh, they have like a variety of activities you know um, talking about Muslims and the Islamic revival is very important to mention these activities in details uh, you know a masjid you know a masjid in Islam it should be like um, a place where everything really happens if you find uh, if, if you read the seerah or the life of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam you find that um, the masjid was a place where uh, Muslims God. met celebrated, learned, uh, mourned, and the, subhanAllah you'd find that it was a place where Muslims, uh, you know, uh, had their, it was like that most pivotal point of society. So it was um, an Islamic center, but just everything ha was happening there. You find that our masajid in the Middle East or the Muslim countries in general, they have become more like uh, for, for rituals only, where people come to pray, where people come just to, uh, yeah, even even the classes, is, is, uh, you know, it, it, it's not really, most of the masajid there, they're not place of education. But subhanAllah, like the masjid in the state, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's role is like a shelter where everybody comes. You know, it's like if you are having a problem with your spouse, you come and seek, uh, you know, advice from the imam. Imam, imams there, they have, and I worked as an imam myself for uh, several years, and uh, the imam is like the judge. He's like the one that who is the marriage council. He's actually the leader of the salah. He's actually the leader of the community. He's the one who he's a teacher. Subhanallah, he's he's doing so many roles and so many tasks, and and it's it's, it's beautiful because it, it almost like brings you back to the uh, you know original Islam, you know to, to how Islam used to be, how the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi gathered his sahaba around him, how the the role of the message was so important. Our message there, they're like uh, active, like you know. Be uh, you know uh, cells and, and it, it just it's you know so many things happen like every single day you find uh, uh, you know the uh, 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 wedding taking place you're being invited for aqiqa for maybe to to celebrate the birth of a child and you know being invited um, you know to eat you find that you're coming every you go to uh, seek education you are going to ask for advice you are going as a youth you are going there for an entertainment uh, you know acti activity you are going there to seek also the advice and find good um, you know Muslim friends just like yourself so there's so many things that are happening in the masjid and amongst these activities as well is uh, activities that really help you um, you know change your life it's really I mean, there's like that that um, it's like almost like a spiritual council you know we as imams there uh, people a lot of people come to us tell me well Sheikh I you know I used to be uh, drunk. I mean, I, you know, I I used to drink all the time. I used to be addicted to drugs. I used to be, you know, I used to have a girlfriend. I used to do this. I used to do that. How can I'm sick of this life? And alhamdulillah, I find that a lot of like these, like they remind of there are like spiritual hospitals, pretty much. These masajid, like receiving all these patients. And alhamdulillah, you find a lot of the masjid crowd. They the they chose a certain path when they first came, and they were really deceived by by the American dream. But then after they do, as I said before. The, and after they, they got all, all of these like uh, things or they accomplished their dreams, so-called dreams, it turned to be like it was nightmare, it was not a dream. So, um, just, this is just to talk about the activities. So now uh, we go back to, uh, you know, how the, subhanAllah, to the um, uh, Muslim immigrants and, and basically, as I said, their present was uh, started really uh, showing in the early 50s as they started coming as professional Muslim doctors and engineers and, and, and so many of, um, fields um, you know, that really even dedicated to the uh, technology of this country. A lot, if, if personally, when I go to the Silicon Valley, which is uh, you know, in San Francisco area, and it's, it's called, it's, you know, Silicon Valley is the place where everything happens, is where, where the Apple and the iPhones are made, uh, I mean, basically started there, I mean, all the, you know, all of these like t technology or that revolution of technology, they started from Silicon Valley. You find that a lot of the Muslim engineers work there and the, subhanAllah, they are, you know, I remember when I was in Seattle, which is the, the headquarters of Microsoft, as they moved to Seattle uh, in, in um, Washington states, you find very close, I mean, I, I, I talked to a lot of the close um, employees that worked with like Bill Gates and others, and they told me that SubhanAllah, like those guys, like some of our Muslim people, they're affecting major, major roles in Microsoft, which is a multi-million dollars, you know, in, in industry, multi-billion dollar industry, right? So, alhamdulillah, it, it, um, those Muslims, mashallah, they accomplished now Ameri the, the American dream. But then they also realized that their generation, they're losing their generation, right? The second generation, um, 
I mean their kids and, and their grandchildren. And they also realized that there is a special vacuum. So they started uh, feeling the need to build a masajid. Initially, and I remember the, the older uh, brothers, they would tell us that how they used to pray uh, in a basement, you know, and uh, some of them used to play at like rent like a small store to just make it for Jum'ah. And even, <laughs> you'll wonder if I tell you, some of them used to even pray Jum'ah on Sunday. Because they said Jum'ah is, is a work day, we cannot take off, so we'll just pray Jum'ah on our day off. Yes, these things used to happen. Uh, SubhanAllah, uh, it's, it's weird, but um, it tells you that you know how things change, SubhanAllah. And um, so the, the, the movement of building masajid started really like rising in the 70s. Masjid after another. And some of these masajid are, SubhanAllah, massive. Like I've been to some of these masajid and MashaAllah, they're like, $30 million masjid, you know, $20 million, $15 million, and uh, beautiful architecture. And you, and you find thousands of people praying there. I mean, uh, and so many of them, alhamdulillah. So like, like these days, it almost became like, like, now these days, like in the States, it's a challenge to find enough imams for all these masjids. There's so many of them. It's like, as I said, like about 6,000 masjids across country, coast to coast. Now they, they're even trying to find imams. They, they can't find enough imams because so many of them and those who are qualified from the Muslims to be an imam are very few, very few. So again, the Muslims start really feeling the need for spirituality and they started, alhamdulillah, paying attention to the masjid. So the first step was to just build the masjid. But then for a long time, there was, there was nothing else happening except a masjid. Is a masjid enough? Of course it's not enough because a masjid it could be a place for prayer. But then you as, um, as a youth, you may not uh, enjoy the masjid as much, especially if it doesn't have any activities to fit you, right? Or maybe you, uh, or, or basically you are, uh, you, you know, if, if, if a child goes to the masjid and there's no education that is catering to the you know, Muslim children, uh, also that, you know, he's not going to benefit or she's not going to benefit and uh, will grow up in, in a way that uh, will not help him to kind of build this or uh, like you're trying to immune your child to resist because the society, all of it, is, is going one way, subhanAllah, like promoting, um, you know, un-Islamic things, and you are just resisting all of this. Trying to resist, trying to resist, but then if, you, if your immune system is, is, is not strong enough, you will, you will just, uh, at one point, you'll break, right? And, and, and then the next generation will totally, uh, you know, uh, blend, blend, not just blend in, but assimilate completely in society and lose their Islamic identity. So after building in the masjid, Muslims realized, and that started really happening and taking place in the 90s, when they started realizing that there's no Islamic schools. Many masjid been built, but then our kids there were losing them because our kids have to go to public schools, and the public education is secular. Um, you don't learn or you don't learn any religion. Actually, the public education in the public system, or the government schools. I mean, this is what they call it, like just public schools. Uh, it, it's, not, it's, it's not promoting any religion, rather it's actually promoting uh, that, uh, you know, Darwinism, you know, that things just came on their own and uh, it's just so secular. So uh, Muslims, when they start seeing their, uh, their second generation being, you know, Americanized, so Americanized, to, um, um, there's nothing wrong being, with being Americanized as long as you, you do it in the halal way, you know, uh, in the right way. But then some of them start taking the uh, you know, these like negative things from society like earring, like boys putting earrings and, and girls, you know, taking off their hijab and, and just tr starting having uh, boyfriends and girlfriends and starting having even uh, kids, you know, and w out of woodlock. So they realize the importance of Islamic schools. So alhamdulillah, in the 90s, a lot of these Islamic schools started coming to surface. And alhamdulillah, uh, many of them were uh, were built and um, the uh, they had like almost like in every major city pretty much these days you find at least one or two or five or even ten some schools subhanallah at, at some of the major cities but at least you'll find one uh, th that is you know um, uh, providing services to, to the Muslims and uh, basically they offer uh, the, the education which is like you know, that you need like the American curriculum from math uh, science English and, and so on plus the Islamic education, uh, you know, bes uh, beside that. At the same time, we find that um, that was not still sufficient because our kids would go to summer school, but then after summer school, you know, there's no activities for them to do. I mean, and obviously, if kids, if, it's, if they have too much time, they're going to be thinking of, of other things, right? So they start also Muslims start realizing that there is a need to, to, for something beyond, uh, you know, masajid and Islamic schools. They start realizing that there is definitely a need 
for youth centers. Youth centers. So they start building youth centers, which are places that really helped, um, you know, in bringing the youth, attracting them, where they find a gym, where they find, uh, you know, um, uh, places to play basketball and, and like soccer fields and basketball fields and or courts. I mean, uh, or at least basketball hoops, uh, so that they can, you know, uh, have some fun. And uh, they would just uh, places for built for this kind of uh, purpose. Okay, so. Um, uh, I was saying basically that um, uh, Islamic now uh, revival movement ha is now progressing. Is just Subhanallah, it keeps building up, you know, in one stage after the other. And then after the Islamic, uh, as I said, like you know, it started with like masajid, then Islamic schools, now youth centers, and now Alhamdulillah, it went beyond that. Now you even have Islamic colleges, Islamic universities in the states where you have. Uh, students of knowledge going there and, and taking, getting a bachelor's in fiqh, like jurisprudence, or a bachelor de degree, or master's or PhD degree even, in hadith or tafsir interpretation or the knowledge of narratives, right? Uh, so, so it, it's, it, mashallah, it became, uh, it became very different, subhanAllah. So, um, now Muslims at this stage, they were still, they were under attack. Because, especially after September 11th, and a lot of the, uh, the, uh, uh, the Muslims, they realized that they do not really know much about Islam. And they start re really realize that, you know, media is just bombarding them with messages that they cannot even answer. So Muslims, as, uh, alhamdulillah, this is like, uh, almost like we, we, we uh, reached maybe like the, the highest level uh, of uh, Islamic revival. Of course, it's not the highest level, but pretty much now it's the highest point that Muslims were able to reach in establishing TV station. So for the first time, it started only like a couple of years ago, where we started seeing Islamic TV stations, something that you've never seen before. SubhanAllah, and it only started uh, two years back. So we even find, uh, find TV stations, and you found uh, a lot of these stations are promoting, um, you know, uh, Islamic education. Plus, they're also um, are refuting a lot of the, these uh, this misconceptions that people see on the media. Inshallah Ta'ala, we'll be mentioning uh, in the in, in the, the next uh, uh, segment of the program, um, the the importance of uh, you know the Islamic revival and how it really affected the Muslim community in, in the states, uh, especially in the states and the hum the Ummah at large. As we will see that a lot of goodness happened and came uh, from these Muslims. And shall be mentioning some of these examples. So inshallah Taala, uh, we'll be listening to your questions. We'll be having like a discussion about that, and uh, we need our audience to stick around because we'll be back inshallah for a lot more. Mercy for Mankind is an outreach organization that is solely dedicated to sharing the beautiful message of Islam with those that may not have heard about it or they might have gotten the wrong message. It is a global message sending that mercy to the entire mankind, the mercy of Islam. back and uh, with a very interesting topic about the Islamic revival movement in the US how Islam started how Islam you know uh, has been alhamdulillah spreading and progressing how much there's a lot of fruits that Muslims have harvested uh, that even helped the, the Muslim uh, societies elsewhere not just in the states and have mashallah con contributed a lot towards their success as well in many other fields and we're having a very nice discussion uh, within the break, and, and uh, some of you came up with very interesting, really, topics and, um, you know, or points that you really wanted to discuss about, and I just wanted to share that with our audience. Some of you were talking about Ramadan, Eid, some conferences, you know, conferences, and uh, the, 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 the basically the future of Islam in the U.S., and uh, maybe we can show our audience, mm -hmm. maybe start with the sisters. Okay, uh, I just wonder how do they spend Ramadan there, the number of hours there, is it long day, short day, and, uh, and the activities do they do, uh, how do they attract uh, kids to love Ramadan, to be, uh, to be fasting, is it only focusing on family, the families only, the people who, or, or are there ways, uh, that there are different ways of activity, or there are different activities in masjids, in, in places, so how do they attract the kids? specifically the kids there, to love spending Ramadan because as you know, 
Christmas time there is, is where everybody's happy, right. enjoying. So how can they make Ramadan as happy and joyful uh, like when we talk about, uh, I'm sorry for the comparison, oh, the comparison between the, uh, I know that starting from now up to a month, um, coming month, it's the celebration of Christmas. Right. So when it comes to Ramadan, how do they prepare kids for that and what do they do and uh, Very how interesting. do they spend it? Very interesting. Thank you. Um, uh, uh, SubhanAllah, for, for someone who's, who's um, born and raised in a Muslim country and is raised uh, and is, is used to all these like, you know, um, rituals that happen with the month of Ramadan and, and used to uh, a lot of the Islamic environment during the month of Ramadan is like shocking because you go to a, to a non-Muslim country and you don't find any of these like you know activities or any of these at least like you know looks you know like for for instance you go to a Muslim country during the month of Ramadan you find lights you know you find uh, the lamp of Ramadan they have like this fanus they call it the right lantern? the yeah. lantern and they find uh, you know they have a lot of the um, decorations and, and uh, subhanAllah it's just, it's, it's just a whole new world, right? Uh, our kids, to be honest with, with you, those who are born and raised in the States, they're not really uh, enjoying this, uh, you know, side of, of the, 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 the beauty and the sweetness of Ramadan that uh, kids would, would look forward to, you know, in a Muslim land because you know, a month of Ramadan for them is only in the masjid and only at the house. You know, a lot of the kids, um, they go to, the, to their schools, they're fasting. And then after that, they go to their homes. Um, a lot of the families they have uh, they have done the, the same the same kind of Ramadan look that that you see on the street and the Muslim countries. Uh, they they did it in uh, their homes. They got them the, those like uh, lanterns and they got them those like you know uh, Ramadan decoration and uh, and some of them don't even care. It's been like too long. They've been in the states for such a long time that they don't even care about that. But then the real Ramadan. The, to be honest with you, with you, is the most important uh, part of Ramadan is the uh, uh, ibadah part, that worship. That you know, Ramadan is all about the worship. It's, Ramadan is the month of worship. Uh, to be honest with you, like a lot of the Muslims, they say that we enjoyed Ramadan the most when it came, um, you know, to, uh, to to this part, the part of worship and just focusing on ibadah. You go to the masjid, you'll find, mashallah, like real ibadah, like Muslims praying tarawih every single masjid. Is praying tarawih. You will never find a masjid that is not praying tarawih in Ramadan. And the majority of the masjid, they finish the whole Quran in the month of Ramadan. At least once. Some masjid, more, twice. And some masjid, even more in, in Tahajjud. You find masjid doing atikaf. Like there is atikaf pretty much in every, you know, at least in every masjid. You find a group of Muslims doing atikaf, which is staying in seclusion for the last 10 days in Ramadan in the masjid. Staying in the masjid just do nothing but ibadah and just staying uh, in, in, you know, uh, within the premises and not leaving the masjid or the musalla area specifically during that time. So um, my experience personally that I really enjoyed Ramadan uh, and, and it changed my life. You know, I remember as a teenager I, when I used to go to the masjid in Ramadan and I would see everyone praying in the masjid and I would see subhanAllah that between even the, the prayers there's like very spiritual, spiritual uh, moving message that, that we Imam would give and, and everyone is just there subhanAllah you are re leaving all of the haram behind you are leaving all the un-Islamic things which you are free to do uh, outside of the doors of the masjid you are leaving all of this for the sake of Allah so you can imagine your reward with Allah so Allah uh, gives you uh, subhanAllah such a boost of faith in your heart because you left all of these things for his sake Allah is the most generous so Allah it was the most amazing experience and it tremendously helped from who I am today, after the atikaf was over, and after you know the month of Ramadan was over, I remember, um, you know, I was like I took a different route totally because I started seeing things differently. So yeah, from this point, from this point, um, I would say that Ramadan in the states is amazing if you really want to worship. But if you want to celebrate and do the you know what, what Muslims do, unfortunately, from you know like uh, in their culture, from like being up all night watching TV or hanging out and shopping and eating all kind of sweets and all kind of different food, no, I mean Alhamdulillah, Muslims over there have readapted uh, that to just you know taking benefit. The spiritual, exactly. the spiritual side part. of uh, Islam and the exactly. spiritual side of Ramadan. Exactly, but the, the, the social one they have uh, kind of uh, neglected which sometimes can turn to be good, but it's always good to have a co combination of both as well. Okay, so I, I think... Um, uh, I want to ask you about uh, 
How do they spend uh, Eid vacation? Huh? Oh, nice, nice. MashaAllah, yeah. So Ramadan comes after Ramadan Eid, right? Yeah. <laughs> now talking about Ramadan and uh, Atikaf. Uh, Eid, uh, over there, it's, it's uh, so, so sad um, to, to mention that you don't really enjoy Eid, except maybe on the first day. And in certain parts, um, you know, uh, of the U.S. where you have a lot of, like, you know, some of the big pockets uh, in the states like New York City, um, you know, northern Jersey, like Chicago, like maybe uh, Dearborn, Michigan, like Detroit area, like maybe uh, Los Angeles and, and Houston. And some of these, like, there are certain pockets where Muslims are concentrated. And those Muslims, they usually, like, rent a huge place, like a convention center or something, and they would have the H celebration. Or... Um, something that really started happening um, at um, you know maybe late 90s uh, or maybe maybe even late after uh, you know maybe even like 2000 2001 uh, where Muslims started renting the uh, the, the entire the, basically a facility or at least a portion of the facility of Six Flags like theme parks theme parks where people go and take like uh, all kind of rides and the and the like were roller coasters and it's like a place of celebration you go as a Muslim. Uh, not necessarily on the Eid day. Some some of them some of them they do it on the Eid day. Others they do it after the Eid, where they would go over there and they would start, uh, you know, uh, their Eid prayer. And after that, they will have uh, alhamdulillah or so, sort of gifts for the children. So you find a lot of these masajid. They bring a lot of toys and gifts for the children. So after the Eid the prayer is over, you know, they give it, to, and the kids look forward to it. So pretty much a lot of the masajid they have they, they have adopted this activity toys to the kids and, and gifts. So kids feel the, the celebration of Da'id. And as I said, even sometimes they go beyond that and they would rent a theme park, or at least a portion of this theme park, and uh, they, they would just spend the, the entire day having like, you know, halal food, like uh, they would have, um, you know, as, uh, basically activities like uh, speeches, they would have contests, they would, uh, you know, take um, rides and, and so on and really have fun. So. Um, it, it's it's sad to live in a small place or a small town or a small city um, in Daid because small towns really don't enjoy it much. But it's, that's why I, I personally advise um, Muslims to always stay, and this is the advice of the Prophet ﷺ himself, to go to the place of concentration, the place of concentrations where Muslims are, and stick with them. Because otherwise, you'll be overtaken by the, by the shaitan. As the Prophet ﷺ said, that um, uh, shaitan, the Ibn Adam, the, the shaitan, is the wolf of the son of Adam. And he said that the qasi and the wolf will eat from the flock, the sheep that goes astray, it leaves the group or leaves that flock of sheep. So he said, فَعَلَيْكُمْ بِالْجَمَعَةِ So stick with the jama'ah, with the Muslim you know, group of believers. Otherwise, you'll be overtaken by the shaitan and defeated. Um, so the uh, subhanAllah, when it comes to the Eid, it's, it's, it's really interesting to see Muslims coming together. And, and by the way, the, you know, the Eid, uh, which is Eid al-Fitr and Eid al-Adha, they, the, they are the time of the year that you see Muslims that you've never seen before. I mean, it's the biggest um, really gathering for Muslims because you find Muslims who, who don't even pray Jum'ah, but then they, they make sure that they come for Eid. And they make sure they bring their children so that they can feel you know, that uh, they're celebrating. It feels good, you know, because obviously you're not really celebrating any other, um, you know, holidays uh, as a Muslim there, like from Christmas or any of these other holidays because um, you're, you're Muslim, so it's the time of the year that you celebrate. Um, I, I think our sister... I just want to ask about your uh, personal experience uh, with the American people there. Have you ever uh, succeeded in converting some Americans to Islam? Yeah, inshallah Ta'ala will, uh, will be like um, speaking in details about the issue of da'wah but, but definitely alhamdulillah there are uh, a lot of Americans who accept the Islam alhamdulillah uh, through uh, a lot of the efforts alhamdulillah uh, Allah bless me to be one of them um, but, but definitely uh, inshallah we'll be speaking in details about the issue of da'wah and the issue of you know uh, the, the spread of Islam and uh, inshallah we'll be even training each other on how to do that I recall also, Muhammad, I had a question. Yeah, I wanted to know about the religious freedom in the U.S. Like, Americans, do they respect uh, the gathering between Muslims during the Eid, Eid Adha, Eid Al-Fitr? And do they accept masjid's construction? And, uh, and also, do they respect the hijab or also the adhan and prayer time? Yeah, like, mashallah, it's a very good question. Uh, so basically, the... Uh, you're speaking here about the ex, the, how tolerant American people are. 
Yeah. They're very, I mean, alhamdulillah, for the most part, they are very tolerant. You know, as a sister, she was saying that, you know, have people accepted Islam? Or do people accept Islam? Yes, we have a lot of Americans that actually accept Islam. And that shows you that those people who are accepting Islam, they are good people. They're tolerant. Okay, they're, they listen to you, they respect you, and then they give themselves a chance to, to really uh, research your, your religion and see what it's all about. So we find that a lot of the, uh, the Americans, they, they are very, very respectful people when it comes to yeah, others. Faiths and religions. But especially after the 9 11. Right. They still respect us? Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah it's, it's still, uh, for the most part, as I said, for the most part, Muslims mm. predominantly, alhamdulillah, over there, mashallah, they do not suffer from racism. I mean, there are uh, isolated cases here and there, mm -hmm. but uh, subhanAllah, I, I've traveled very frequently. I've visited a lot of the countries, and I've seen countries where Muslims never even like had a problem with that country they, they 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 never like did any terrorist attack they have never really even bothered that country but then you find how racist people are in that country so when i see muslims that you know you know basically after especially after september 11th and uh, uh you know it was such um a traumatizing experience it was shocking for the americans to see what the twin towers falling down thousands of people getting killed and and so it it was uh, when I see how much the uh, U.S. was like you know society was was you know affected by uh, you know some of these actions, and I see how tolerant they are. It's amazing, they are really nice people. You know, compared to the other societies, right? So, but alhamdulillah, you know, I've uh, I've, I've I've dealt with uh, thousands of them, pretty much um, literally thousands uh, throughout the years, and I found them to be the most subhanallah yeah, amazing people for the most part. Very respectful, very tolerant. And this is why you find that Islam is the fastest growing religion in the U.S. A lot of Americans accept Islam. Thousands of Americans accept Islam every year, alhamdulillah. Uh, so yes, mashallah, they are very tolerant and they are very respectful. Yep. So, so now I, uh, you know, we, we have, so, so we have also, um, you know, to just remind ourselves that alhamdulillah, that uh, being a Muslim uh, in, in such environment, Sometimes could be very, you know, the best the best way for you to really build your Islamic character. You know, when you find that the whole society is going one way, and you have to really make, make pick a choice, either be a Muslim or be like them. It, 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 that that challenge could be the most spectacular experience or the most spectacular way to build your Islamic identity. So this is just to give you the, the good news, alhamdulillah, and to conclude with our audience that, mashallah, you know, the Islamic revival movement is moving so fast and so successful in the U.S., alhamdulillah, where we find a lot of people been accepting Islam every single day, alhamdulillah, throughout our da'wah efforts, throughout, you know, Muslims really uh, striving to share that beautiful deen, that beautiful message that Allah blessed them with. It is happening, inshallah, will happen. I'll be surprised one day to find uh, Islam coming fr from America, inshallah, to the, to the rest of the world. So inshallah until next time, this is again your host Amr Issamni and inshallah we'll see you soon. Wassalamu alaikum wa